Next, on the OHIO podcast, the monk and the wild man join Buckeye Boggs to discuss Ryan Day's contract extension. They talk about how NIL and money is ruining college football, and they attempt to offer their suggestions on how to fix this mess. Plus, Nick Hickman from Mastermind joins Eric for an exclusive interview. And that all begins right now. It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. To hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the football field. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who will win. It's time for the best Buckeye podcast by fans for the fans where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO podcast. OHIO! Welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Buckeye Boggs, and I am joined by the muck from that state up north holding down the fort for us Buckeye fans in the midst of the mitten kittens. Mm -hmm. And we are also joined by the wild man, Chris Wilds. If you're not satisfied with pickup games and unranked matches, chances are you're aiming higher than most. At Spire, you'll train to be the best. Whether you're drawn to the pool, track, mat, basketball court, or gaming controller, we provide the training you need to achieve your dream. Make our facilities your home or take advantage of free transportation services. Are you ready to unlock your potential? Visit SpireCleveland.com today. That's Spire, S-P-I-R-E. Boys, Ryan Day got a bump in pay and a little bit of a contract extension this week. We knew this news was going to be coming down sooner rather than later. Gene Smith promised so back at the end of the 2021 season when they did their interviews there following uh, the Rose Bowl. And lo and behold, here in the month of May after spring football, it is announced that Ryan Day will be making $9.5 million over the course of the next uh, a season, over the course of the next six years, with a two-year extension, meaning he is contracted to Ohio State as the head coach through 2028. Now, you and I both know that that does not mean that he can't uh, flirt elsewhere, as we've seen coaches uh, get out of their contracts easily before. Um, but I foresee that Ryan Day, given his circumstances, is going to be here for a while. He's got three children, one of which is in junior high, getting ready to be a high schooler here in the Olentangy School District in Delaware County, just north of Ohio State. And he's got two little girls who I'm sure have lots of friends in their school as well. And I just don't think Ryan Day is the type of guy that's going to pick up his family and move to Boston to be the next coach at New England. So. I think that he's going to be here a while. I think he might even be here beyond 2028. And I have been on record of saying that I believe he's going to win a national championship within the first five years of being head coach at Ohio State. And this will be year number four. And I think he's got the, the team and the roster specifically on offense and if that defense can be a top 25 defense, I think we're looking at a national championship caliber team this year. I will start with you first, Chris. Your reaction from Ryan Day getting that bump in pay. He's now making $9.5 million, was previously making $7.6 million. And that $9.5 makes him tied for first in the Big Ten with Mel Tucker up there at that state up north in East Lansing, the Spottens. What do you think, Chris? You like this? So let me preface this whole conversation by saying this. Sports salaries are out of control, both pro and collegiate levels. 
the coach's salary, the NIL deals, resolutions in state Congress to provide profit sharing guarantees to players. It's, it's way out of control. At no time should an athlete or coach ever be a state's highest paid employee ever. Now, that being said, I'm going to contradict myself a little bit here as I move from socioeconomic commentary to sports fandom. In order to you know, maintain a competitive balance and keep Ohio State University in the top tier of college athletics as a fan, I absolutely support Ryan Day getting this extension and bump in pay. Since taking over from Urban Meyer, all Day has done is go 34-4, 23 and one in the conference has only losses to Clemson in the, the semifinal to Alabama in the national title game. Of course, we saw him lose last year to Oregon with an injured first year starter at quarterback and perhaps the most inept defense that the Buckeyes have ever fielded. And then to that team up North in a snowstorm with half the team suffering from the flu and a really stacked loserine team that was filled with seniors which finally made its way to the college football uh, playoff for the first time under hairball. So on the field, Ryan Day has earned this money. In recruiting, Ryan Day has earned this money. You know, in 2019, Day had his lowest ranked class, which was ranked seventh according to 247 Sports. I think it had a composite of 14th. 2021, he jumped to fifth nationally, second in 2020, or fifth in 2020, second in 2021. He sits currently fourth in 2022 and 2023 nationally. But, you know, there's still several opportunities to improve that number. You know, on top of all that, Day as a coach has also really garnered a lot of praise for the way he's handled off-season situations as well. Or off-field situations, I I should say. You had the, you know, the Quinn Ewers debacle, which easily could have turned into a major circus. On top of that, we had... The issue with Marcus Hooker, the sideline fiasco with Kayvon Pope, the defensive transitioning this past offseason, not to mention what went on with the defensive coaching staff last season. And of course, you know, the sad situation with Harry Miller. Day has handled all this with a class, dignity, and, and maturity that I don't know any other coach in the history of Ohio State football could have done. Day is the guy who's going to win Ohio State their next, next national title. It's going to happen sooner rather than later. I think it happens this season. So, yeah, he's absolutely deserving of this pay increase. Monk, what do you think, buddy? I couldn't have said it any better. Literally everything that Chris just said I have written down in front of me as well. Um, You know, like you said, uh, the the off-the-field stuff I think is what really resonates with me. And especially in this time moving forward to where in, uh, in like, recruiting where it seems that – it's not going to be so much about the product you're putting out on the field. So you got to, you got to have something a little different to separate yourselves from all the other people. Um, he's just a total class act in the fact that he has been able to improve what urban Meyer already had at such an elite level and to just keep growing on that. I mean, he definitely deserves this kind of extension. There's no if ands, or buts about it. Because I tell you, the fact that he was making less money than Harbaugh and Tucker and these guys, it, it was kind of looking poorly on our, our uh, program as a whole, definitely on our board and on our athletic department. So at least they got that right. Well, his he was actually making slightly more than Hairball, slightly. Uh, I, uh, Jimmy Just last was, season, right? Correct. Yeah, J- Jimmy Jimmy's getting that bump uh, an extension. He's at uh, six point three this season, uh, with a base salary of six hundred fifty five, which will raise that up to somewhere just over seven, uh, seven point uh, seven point oh five actually. Um, and and of course, uh, Ryan was at seven point two or excuse me, 7.6 last year. So Ryan was still slightly ahead of Harbaugh, but that that Mel Tucker contract changed everything right. in, in these contract extensions. If t- I, I'm here to tell you right now, if Tucker would be making like, let's say 8.2, then I don't see Ryan making any more than 8.5 in this, in this first initial contract. That totally reset everything. Do you agree with that, Chris? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, like I said, it's out of control. You've got what uh, what Kelly got paid down there at LSU. You've yes. got what you know Tucker got up there at Michigan State. What they gave Lincoln Riley. Tell me, when was Lincoln Riley's last national title or Mel yes. Tucker's last national title? Now, granted, Day has not won a national title yet either, but he has his team closer than these guys do. And these schools are just throwing money at these guys for really no reason. Yeah, Tucker had a decent season. But what is his career record? What has he shown prior to this? Right. I don't get it. It, it. it it raises the question that and, – and this is – okay, so not to create an economics discussion, but let's go ahead and go <laughs> there, shall we? Oh, yeah. Is he worth it is the question. Can he – by him being the head coach, is he producing for the university – and more specifically the athletic department, more than what he's being paid? And the answer to that question is a simple yes. Absolutely. If Ryan Day's successful, Ohio State's successful, they're going to bring in a lot more than $9.5 million. Why, why don't you, Eric, why don't you ask the swimming team or the lacrosse team or all these other, I don't want to call them lesser sports, but let's face it, revenue-wise, they're lesser sports. Ask them if Ryan Day is worth it, you know? <laughs> That's a good point. I would think that if they're smart, they'd say yes. Absolutely. Because, He's because, because if it's the, because if it's not for Ryan Day and Ohio State football program, they don't have a team. Right. So I, you know, I understand how people can get upset, Chris. Like, like you said, like I, I can understand why someone would say there's absolutely no reason a football coach should be making nine point five million. And I would say if, if if we could go and tell Woody Hayes what football coaches are making today, he'd be like, what? <laughs> you know, like because it's not about the dollars. If And that's the thing about Ryan Day. I don't think this nine point five million dollar contract is about feeding his ego. I would. And, and, and I also don't think Ryan Day is the type of person that when he goes out and does something, he's going to let everybody know that he paid it forward. I would not be surprised if a lot of that nine point five million does not end up in the pockets of other people who need it. Oh, I absolutely. Me. Well, he showed that, you know, just with the uh, press conferences and the Harry Miller stuff, you know, he kept deflecting everything and making sure it was about Harry Miller and not him. Like he, he's just a stand up dude. And there was one, one thing I forgot to say that I did have my notes um, with him under Ryan Day, the program has had four consecutive semesters of a team cumulative GPA of at least a 3.0 or higher. And like that's that, impressive. Yeah, and that and for 2022 team, they are they have 14 players already graduated. So that is, the stuff this guy does with the off the field, like Chris said, is just second to none. And he really separates himself from everybody else. If I'm not mistaken, what Ryan Day is going to pay in taxes federally into the state of Ohio for that 9.5 million, he's not he's not coming home with more than six. Right. So oh, yeah, definitely. So when people get all upset about the 9.5 million, um, you should stop and also think about how much is being taken out in taxes alone. Okay. He he's he's keeping a lot of things afloat federally. And in the state of Ohio with that contract, my friend. So it's it don't 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 all think that he's pocketing all nine point five million here. OK, that's not how it works. And, and and to and even worse, if you look at Lincoln Riley's contract and what he has to pay out in taxes in the state of the communist state of California. I mean, I it, good luck with that one, too, man. Um, so looking at this over, you know, I, I, I don't want to overreact. I think it's 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 great for him. I think he's a good man. I think he's probably going to be very wise with his money. I know for a fact that when he became the head coach of Ohio State, he did not leave the school district that his children are in and go over to like Mirfield and and, and buy a house where Urban lived and, you know, over <laughs> Mirfield, Dublin. OK, he didn't do those things. I think this guy is well grounded and. A lot. I think a lot of people who get all upset about that, too. I think there's a, a sense of jealousy there, to be honest with you. You agree, Chris? I do, Eric. I think it is. There is some sense of jealousy, and like you said, I truly believe that 
for or for Ryan Day, yeah, the money's nice, but I don't think it's as much about the money as it kind of was about getting that respect from the university saying, you know, well, we want you here. We want you here long term. We know you're worth this. We know you deserve to be the highest paid or at least tied for the highest paid coach in our conference. You need to be paid among the top coaches in this country because you are one of the top coaches in this country. I think it's as much about the respect as it was about the money. I agree 100 percent. Now that we've 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 backed Ryan Day and patted him on the back and given him every excuse in the world as to why he deserves this. Now let's take the other side of this argument and ask the question, is money ruining college football? Chris, you were passionate about it in your first response. I can't wait to hear what you think about this. Well, as I said in segment one, Eric, money is destroying college football. And it starts with the coaches. As I said, no coach should ever be the highest pay- paid employee of a state but you have to do that to keep competitive balance and there's the nil which had it been rolled out properly in in a manner where there was some system of regulation i would have had no issue with it because these players are earning a lot of money for the school and they do deserve something extra yeah they do deserve the scholarship but they do deserve a little something extra and, and more than the stipend because they are earning a ton of money for these universities. However, these colleges just took this rule and made it a free for all. You got Texas A&M out there buying a number one recruiting class. You've got coaches and representatives from schools actively calling players currently on other teams rosters and attempting to use NIL money to lure them away. You have small colleges buying top recruits, which all the way, this is going to hurt these recruits in the long run, whether they see it now or not. Because the fact is, a small school may afford one or two of these guys, but is Jackson State really going to receive national coverage when they're at best a 500 team in a weak conference? No. So now you're hurting your draft stock, and then you've got the yahoos out there, and as you said, the communist state of California wanting to introduce revenue sharing for college athletes. Are you serious? The the sad part is the kids are going to get paid, but they're going to suffer in the long run. The schools are going to suffer, especially if the revenue sharing is introduced, since let's face it, most of the lesser athletic programs and even some of the non-athletic programs that are funded by college football and men's basketball, uh, you know, where are they going to get that money if we're given 40 percent, 50 percent of the revenues to the players? Let me tell you where they're going to get it, Eric. They're going to get it from increased ticket prices and increased tuitions. You're going to find that, you know, it's already difficult enough for an average Ohio family to attend a game at Ohio State. Can you imagine what's going to happen if Ohio follows California, which all states eventually, if this law passes, they're going to have to do it. Let's call it what it is. They're going to have to follow suit. You're going to have tickets being $300 to sit in C deck to watch Florida A&M. Student discounts are going to disappear. You know, you're going. We were already seeing it. the The presence of the fans in the shoe isn't near what it was, especially for these non conference games. And tuitions are going to rise. They're they're not only destroying college sports; they're destroying the college experience with the, the what they're doing. And sadly, I don't know that there's any way to put this particular genie back in the bottle. <laughs> Yeah, it's out of the box, isn't it? It is. They've opened Pandora's box. We, it's out there. Monk, what you got, man? What do you think of this? Uh, it's definitely on the road to ruining college football, unfortunately. It's turning basically into a pro sport. You've got free agency going on now. And the fact that, you know, you got coaches calling other coaches out, even though they're all kind of break in what seems to be the only rule is to that the coaches and the schools are not allowed to help these kids get the NIL, but they're directly giving them the NIL money. So it, it's just a hypocrisy, but uh, yeah, I, it's not looking good. And, but what I'm waiting to see is one of these kids that get paid before they even go to that school to turn around and just dump on that school with the transfer rule, take the money, cut, and go somewhere else. I mean, oh, 
eventually it's it, it's got to come full circle to where these schools are going to start getting bit in the rear end for doing what they're doing and it, it's going to come back to them quinn ewers kind of already did yeah i was gonna say we've seen it already with quinn ewers but you know what i think that's going to end up being a better move for us in the long run anyhow oh I, absolutely yeah, i agree so i got a question before i give you my uh dissertation here is college football still amateurism or not? Yes or no, Chris? Well, Eric, honestly, this is something that I, I, segment three was going to dive a lot into this, but no, I'm just going to leave it at no right now. And I'll, I'll give you my explanation in segment three. Monk says college I, football is still amateurism or not. No, I, I don't think it is, you know, not with them getting paid. And like Chris said, they, if they would have slowed down and just put some type of structure into it, but you know, save that for the next segment. So you're both right. Uh, amateurism in college football is out the door for about, I would say 20 to 30% of the athletes on a division one college football team, meaning the top echelon of players as well as recruits are signing NIL deals that make them basically they're getting paid because they're a player, which means that amateurism no longer exists. However, there are still players on a majority, now not all, but a majority of college teams who are not getting large NIL deals. Okay. They might be getting little things here or there to help them pay for gas and groceries and whatnot, maybe a, a, a car payment or something. Uh, and some shopping money, but it's not like some, all of these guys are walking around with millions of dollars in their pocket. Okay. Mm-hmm. So in a lot of ways, the free market is determining who is getting what now you and I might not like it. And I'll tell you straight up. I dislike it a lot because it creates an unfair advantage, especially for schools that have either A, large boosters um, uh, associations, or B, a booster who's dirty, meaning they can go and start to pay and funnel money to recruits to persuade them to come on campus. And then that might create the situation that you brought up, Monk, where one of these guys who has a multi-million dollar deal craps on that university, walks away, decides to go somewhere else where he's being lured for a larger contract. Now that player wins and the university loses. And we, like mm-hmm. I said, we've kind of already seen that slightly. Now I'm, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent against it. And the reason being is I think that this is a good thing for some people. Uh, let's take a look at the Travion Henderson situation, shall we? Um, the guy has make, is making millions of dollars, and he's able to give his mother money, and, and she desperately needed it, okay? So there are situations like that where, where someone comes from a very poverty situation, and because of the money that he's receiving in his NIL deal, he's able to help not just himself but family members out. And this was something that if you go back to the Reggie Bush days at USC – was what their great argument was. And so this can be a positive thing. It, it The problem is, is what we just saw happen in the SEC. You've got Nick Saban out there crying that Texas A&M has purchased all of their players. Which he's then, been doing for years. Yeah. <laughs> you then have Jimbo Fisher basically, basically getting up there and saying, whoa, 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 now hold on a second. Uh, we did not break any rules here. And Jimbo Fisher has, has at multiple times basically said, hey, it's the wild, wild west, man. We're going to do uh, what, what we can to get these guys here. And there's no rules set in place. And he's and he's right because that's because the NCAA yeah. has got no backbone. And they had they years ago, they saw this coming and they could have set parameters and things in place to make sure this didn't happen. But you know why they didn't? It's because of people like Nick Saban in Alabama who were their cash cow. And then you got Nick Saban now, who's been so used to getting the number one draft pick and getting whoever he wants, now has to compete on a dollars and cents level. And Alabama is not the largest university when it comes to a fan base and a uh, booster revenue producing 
um, uh, a type of uh, area where he can promise these kids multi-million dollars. And, well, and, and you can tell. So now Greg Sankey, who is the commissioner of the SEC, all of a sudden has to come out and he's trying to save face by saying, yeah, we've got to, you know, we've got to look into some of these things. Greg has known for years that the SEC is dirty with bag men. He's known it for years. Don't let Greg Sankey uh, uh, pull the wool over your eyes for one minute until – these conferences, Pac-12, Big Ten, uh, ACC, come together and and corral what has happened in the SEC and say, here's the level playing field. Until that happens, I'm here to tell you NIL is going to continue to be a problem in college football. Now, as a Buckeye fan, all I'm going to say is if, if Texas A&M can do it, Alabama can do it, then we sure as heck better be doing it as well. That's my two cents, Chris. Yeah, and you're not wrong, Eric. I mean, and the fact is we have such a large alumni base. We have, let's, I mean, let's call it what it is. We have some very wealthy alumni, and we have the ability to spread the money around, I think, even better than Texas A&M or a Texas uh, you know, so, yeah, I mean, we have the ability to do that. But, you know, like you said, Eric, they've known about this for years. If you look back, I'll tell you about the exact time you knew it was about 2000 and what, 2003. I mean, what would have happened if, if we would have had a structured form of this in place when Maurice Claret was in college, when Mike, uh, Mike Williams, I believe, was the other gentleman who tried to jump to the to the draft and and. and and break the three years removed from high school rule. You know, they've had to have seen this coming. They have had 20 years to get this right, and they made no movement towards doing it. it the NCA has nobody but themselves to blame for this mess. And the NCAA, and, and the NCAA Chris, at, at this point, has no voice in college football. Oh, they have less teeth than a newborn baby. I mean, they got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they they can't even suck on the tit of this thing, dude. No, I mean, no, th at this, this point, thing, they have this ship has sailed from away from them. They they aren't bringing it back. Yeah, and again, this is something that I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into a little bit in that next segment. So, uh, um, you know, it's not all on the NCAA though. I mean, these certain states all voted it to be passed and kind of pushed it even faster. You know, like. Um, I know Texas did it and a few other states. So, I mean, they really <laughs> kind of wished it into existence. Yeah, here. you're not wrong, Jace. Not at all. I mean, the government is almost as much to blame as the NCAA. Yep. And it, like you guys, as much as I hate to say it, we have to get on board. We, if you want to stay competitive and not get left behind, you got to join in. These state governments, though, had no choice because – if you look at how important it is for Ohio State to be successful in football because of how much money it generates to not only the university but to all of the businesses in Columbus on a game day, right? I mean, it, it is it is mind blowing how how affected businesses were during the COVID years when fans couldn't go to the games, and. And so they had no choice but to do this because they knew they had to stay competitive with the teams from Texas and California and Florida, et cetera. And so I can't blame the governing bodies of Ohio or any other state who, who have wrote these things in the law because if you don't, then you're going to get left in the dust. So, right. so amateurism, to get back to my original point, amateurism in a sense is, is mostly dead. And – it's been dead for a while, guys. I mean, they they've been they've been faking this thing for a long time. And just like Jimbo Fisher said in his initial press conference when he announced the recruiting class for 2022, what was happening under, you know, under underground has been brought to the forefront. It's now it's now allowed. You can see it all. And so what's happening is a lot of people who were kind of blind to the fact of what was really happening in the CD underground of college football now all of a sudden seem dumbfounded by this because they they were 
they were blind to it. They wanted to be blind to it. Let do not sit here and think for one second that Ohio State has not paid players illegally. Right. Right. They have. Absolutely. I'm telling you, they have. And for all of you um, pompous Michigan fans up there who say we've done it right, <laughs> oh crap, you yeah. haven't done it right either. No. Bad These life. kids, there, there have always been players who've gotten handshakes or McDonald's bags, as they do in the SEC down in Georgia. This has been happening, and the NCAA has done nothing about it because, like I said, they've had no power. And so they just threw their hands up and said, fine, let it be a free-for-all. You all want to destroy yourselves? Go ahead. And that's what we're seeing. Are we seeing the destruction of college football? No, but what we're seeing is we're seeing the birth of minor league football. Yep. It is, and we've always known that college football was the minor leagues for the NFL. We've always known that. But what's ironic to me, guys, is that the NFL has more structure right now than college football does. Well, here's what I mean by that. Eric, Chris have o- you gotten a hold of my notes again? <laughs> Chris Olave just signed a contract. He can't just decide next year, I don't want to play for New Orleans anymore. He can't do that. He has to fulfill that contract. Now, he can do certain things to try to get him to trade him, but New Orleans owns the rights to him. College football, no one owns the rights to any player. They can get up and leave whenever they want now. It, it, it It's crazy. That aspect of things to me is crazier than the NIL stuff to me at, right now at this moment. And it's not like the college football is going to be able to make a draft anytime soon, guys. And so it was it was always going to happen. NIL was always going to become this uh, recruiting ploy. As soon as it was uh, allowed to happen, you knew it was going to happen because of the stru- the fact that college football has no structure. So, I, I mean, I can't sit here and be mad at USC. I can't sit here and be mad at Texas A&M. They are taking advantage of the fact that there is no system right now in place to say you can't do that. Even though everybody has always said as a little gentleman's agreement, NIL cannot be used to recruit. It absolutely is everywhere. Yeah, definitely transfer portal included. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, we can sit here and get mad at all we want, but I'm telling you, until there's things in place, I want Ohio State to be to spend the most amount of money in NIL possible because I want the top guys because I want to win because I'm competitive. It's what's that old saying? Hate the game, not the player. Right. right. <laughs> That's what well, we're living in right now, man. Close. But, uh, close. I mean, even with that, though, do you really want these top guys? What if, you know, what if they're the, that type of person that puts money above everything and it just brings out their like toxic character traits and what happens when you introduce that into your team what's that gonna do i mean ryan ryan days had it right with you know bringing in good fit people more so than the top ranked player Uh, that's a good point chris or or, uh jason and and jason i think that'll continue among some coaches and that yeah i mean that's just uh, that's what i love about ryan day and it's just the whole culture change that he's brought to the school and i mean i know you want to do everything right but you have to get a little dirty sometimes (laughs) you just have to yeah you got to play the game man yes sir you've got to play it um now can you play the game be a little dirty and still be of good character absolutely i think ryan day's done it so far yeah I mean, again, I, th- I does does Ryan Day when he when he knows that the kid is not going to be a good fit and he's all about the money? I think Ryan Day steers away from that. Absolutely. But if he's a good kid and he's gonna, uh, you know, take that money but still be wise with it, you know, I you know, I think they've right. got the people in place that are t- you know helping these kids so they don't just take the money and blow it, you know? Right. Or do good things with it, like G. Scott, for example. Great point. Great point. <clears throat> All right, so so this we know this is a problem. We all admit it's a problem. How 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 are we going to fix it? So here's my question: What would you do to fix the transfer portal, nil, etc.? What would you do to fix it? And then after we you, we hear from you on what you're going to do to fix it, when we come back around, 
I want us to try to answer the question on what we think college football will look like in five years. Not what we want it to look like, but what we think it will look like. So I'll start with you, Chris. What would you change? How are you going to fix the transfer portal NIL? Well, Eric, I don't know that there is a way to fix this system. And and that truly breaks my heart uh, because you mentioned something earlier about you didn't think college football was dead. I, I disagree. College football is dead. Universities are still going to field teams, but college football, as we know it, is dead. The amateur sport of football is dead. Uh, you know, the fact is the only thing you can do is partially revert back to the old system as far as the, the transfer portal goes. Players who want to transfer are going to have to sit a season. You're going to have to affect – them financially in order to get them to not play these games unless there's evidence of something egregious you know we had justin fields had had the deal with the racism down in georgia that was an egregious incident and and i'm all for someone being able to transfer at that point and, and get to play right away or or a team who's you know maybe suffered the death penalty and you know you have players on that team who were not involved they should be able to transfer or a school that's maybe closing down their program. But other than that, make them sit. I mean, they also, they have to put limitations on this NIL for the players and the schools, both, you know, let's institute some sort of a salary cap of sorts, you know, all all player income must publicly be disclosed and accounted for. This would include any stipends NIL dollars, endorsement deals, everything. And a player can only make a certain amount of money a month and a certain amount of money annually. Uh, you'd also need to have some kind of outside the NCAA source and something non-governmental to oversee this process. Because as you said, Eric, the NCAA has no teeth and the government's gone absolutely nuts. If you look at you know California uh, and, and as Jason mentioned, some of these states uh, you know had to push things through because of the. The, the other states who just, you know, decided we're going to go with this. Uh, and, and one of the biggest things is there needs to also be tampering provisions, just like you have in the, in the NFL. And there <laughs> needs to be serious penalties for teams and coaches and reps that contact a signed player or a rostered player in an effort to lure them away with NIL dollars. I, I just think that they they literally they unleashed these changes and truly had no concept of the consequence and now the system's so broken i just don't know if it's fixable monk what would you do uh i i agree with him i I don't know if it is fixable um as far as the like nil i also had something similar to chris to where they have to bring in some type of outside group at every school and i would like to see them control the nil deals and spread it out evenly amongst all um scholarship athletes that way everybody gets a little piece that's not creating any type of unfair tension in the you know in the teams or locker rooms as far as the transfer portal and this is going to be a little life lesson for these kids too because they need to learn what the word commitment is and what it means to be committed so I would implement a rule where when you sign that letter of intent, you have to stay at that school for two years or sit out till the end of that two years if you transfer. And then at your third year, you freely can go one time and transfer out like it. They got you, you can't just up and leave your mortgage and not expect to pay it still. You know, they, they need to learn these life lessons. They're, it just has to be done. So I would I would institute two things. Now this first this first thing that I think can help fix college football. I I did not come up with this. Bobby Carpenter actually came up with this idea and I love it. If you're going to enter the NIL, you cannot receive I'm sorry, if you're going to enter the transfer portal, you cannot receive any NIL money until after 1 year after you have exited the transfer portal. Meaning If you leave a team and you go to another team, you cannot receive an NIL contract until you've been with that team for an entire season. I think that stops a lot of the tampering. I also think that that will slow down some of the transfer portal issues. Yeah, that goes along with what uh, Chris had mentioned too, so I like it. Number two, 
I think college football needs a commissioner. As yes. much as I hate commissioners. <laughs> well, we don't have to make it Kevin Warren, Eric. Yeah, it should be yeah, Gene no, Smith. No kidding. No kidding. Uh, I would make I would make it a commissioner who's got he's got to have a backbone. He has got to be someone who cannot be railroaded by a conference, <clears throat> SEC, or any conference, or any conference commissioner. He has got to have a backbone so that when when these laws and regulations are put in place, that is the the agreement in which all colleges and schools are going to play by, and it is found that a college has broke that uh, that rule, he has got to be able to put his foot down and say – you broke the rule. Here are here here is your punishment. The biggest issue I had with the NCAA in my lifetime is the fact that when they dealt out uh, punishment, it was never consistent. Oh, so uneven. Ever, ever. To quote one of my favorite movies, <laughs> it just it was terrible. So the the punishment has to fit the crime, and it must be consistent every single time. If you if I think they could institute those two things, I think a lot of this would be would be cleaned up pretty quickly. And the first punishment that that commissioner can dole out on a team that breaks a rule is they they are they are not accepted into the college football playoff. You can't like win it. a natty. Period. You're done for a season or or two, depending on the severity of the rule you broke and the, and how they set it up. That would be what I hope they would do to fix college football. Now, Chris, the year is 2027, if we still exist. <laughs> what does college football look like as we embark on the 2027 season? Well, as I said, college football is dead at that point, Eric, completely. Um. You know, as I look at it, I don't think we're going to be able to rein in what we've got going on. So I think we almost just have to say we're going to have to shift. Well, first of all, I think we've already seen the SEC is starting the shift in this direction. You may be seeing it with the let's just call it the coalition uh, starting to structure up in a similar way. The fact is we are about to enter the era of the super conference uh, you're going to have two super conferences and, and all the non-super conference teams may be still flying under the NCAA banner. I don't know. Whether this takes five years or ten years, it's going to happen. Um, but with the NIL, the portal, combined with the SEC's attempt to single-handedly dismantle the NCAA, you know, we're no longer at a level of college athletics. It's professional sports. And Anyone who thinks otherwise, I think at this point, is just fooling themselves. We might as well break the team in the, or the country into two conferences, six divisions, take the top 48 to 60 teams, and model it after the NFL. I mean, seriously, like you said earlier, the NFL has more structure right now in the way they handle player movement, signings, and discipline than the NCAA ever has. So I think at this point, we've almost got to embrace it, Eric. I, I really do. You mentioned the term minor league football. I think that's the point where we're at. And whether it takes five years or maybe 10 years to get there, I think that's definitely the direction. <clears throat> Monk, go for it. What are we going to look like in 2027? Uh, it's funny that he happened to uh, bring up the number 60 as far as the teams, because that's probably all the teams that are going to be left in the uh, FBS. Um, I mean, a lot of teams are going to end up having to – shut down, you know, especially with the mon the type of money being paid to these players and coaches and everything else. Um, I think there's going to be four conferences, but uh, the idea of two definitely makes a lot of sense as well. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's over. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about it. It's, it's a sad time. That's for sure. So in the year 2027, when we sit here on May 22nd of that year and we're talking about Ohio State, I think we're talking about Ohio State being one of the superpowers in college football. I think college football is going to basically uh, create almost like what you see. And it may, they might not call it this, but what we see in minor league baseball between triple, double and single A, 
You're going to have Division One AA schools. You're going to have small Division One college football teams, medium college football teams, and then you're going to have the superpowers and the super conferences that Chris spoke of. I think this is exactly what's going to happen. And I think um, that college football is going to take on a model where it's the haves and the have-nots. The have-nots are going to uh, resemble more of what we currently see and maybe what we saw in the early, you know, before NIL and the transfer portal took over. But those schools are basically going to be taking and developing kids for the superpowers because when they enter the NIL, they're going to want to go to one of the superpowers where they can, you know, cash in on their name, image, and likeness receive more money, and be a part of a team that's competing for a national championship. It's it's the model that, unfortunately, we are heading to. And uh, the tradition of what used to be college football is indeed dead. But that doesn't mean that we can't embrace it, like you said, Chris. I, I, am a, I'm, I bleed scarlet and gray, and I'll bleed scarlet and gray until the day I die. It's who I am. It's what I love. It's, it's, my, it's my hobby. It's my passion. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's my first love, and I'm not going to walk away just because my first love uh, all of a sudden looks drives, – drives a better car and looks a little different than she did back when I was a teenager. I'm still going to love that thing, and I'm going to have to embrace that. doesn't mean I like every aspect of it. doesn't mean that I'm not going to get upset at times, and I tell you, one of the things that I'm going to really hate is those ticket prices, guys, that you mentioned, Chris. Uh, well- and let me tell you something else, Eric, that's really going to bother me about it is you're not going to have the same atmosphere because you're going to see a massive reduction in the number of students who can afford tickets. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what's really, I think, the most disturbing part about it is that is the part of the college experience that you are going to be taking away from so mm-hmm. many, so many students. Uh, you know, we talked earlier this this week about the fact that I'm getting ready to buy my season tickets as they go on sale tomorrow. And I'm in a position where I'm a non-traditional student. I have a full-time job, so I have the availability of funds to go out and buy season tickets at a student pricing. Most of these kids cannot do that. Right. And – that is a part of the game that we will never get back. And it's going to be like going to a pro game now. You know, you don't see a lot of young people at the pro games and more and more, you're seeing a decreasing number of families at the pro games. And I think you're going to lose. I don't know if you're going to lose a lot of fandom, but you're going to see just such a different atmosphere in the fandom that you have versus what we have grown to know when we go to the shoe. Sure. And that, that's what's, I think, the most upsetting part to me. Well, but but let me push back slightly. Fan Being a fan changes over time. I mean, think think about what it was like to be a fan back in the 50s when you could sneak into the horseshoe. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I love the stories that you hear about these kids that back in the 40s and 50s, how they would find a way to sneak into the into the game, you know? And, and watch the game. And and the game itself has changed a lot uh, over that time. And so the sport of football looks different to my son than it than it ever did to me because he wasn't around in the 90s. He he doesn't he doesn't know what playing football is like when you could lower your head and just absolutely go to kill somebody, you know, and Ronnie we don't, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> and we <laughs> don't know what football was like back in the days when you could clothesline somebody, you know, and they had no teeth. And they didn't know what it was like to watch football back when they wore leather helmets and didn't have a face mask. So football is changing. College football is changing. And the fan is changing. And I, I, and I know I know I, I'm with you, Chris. I'm a traditionalist. I'll be the first person to admit that. But I have I have I've come to the understanding that I have to embrace this if I'm going to be a fan. And I, I, you know, it doesn't mean I have to like it, but I'm going to do it because that's the decision and choice I have made is to go ahead and accept some of those changes. It's kind of like the whole targeting rule. I hate it, but I have to accept it. It's a part of the game now. Well, that's kind of what what we thought, guys. That's kind of what we're looking at. I hope you enjoyed this. like I said, dissertation of uh, <laughs> of the state of college football. We we just thought with all the news that was coming out between Satan and and uh, Jimbo, 
and uh, all, all, all the contract of Ryan Day that this was the week to dive into this stuff. And we want to know what you think. Send us an email at the uh, at the Ohio podcast dot com or dot at, at gmail dot com. Let me try this again. <laughs> you can email us at the Ohio podcast at gmail dot com. You can always send us a message on Twitter or Facebook where we're there as well. And uh, we want to thank Jason for starting our TikTok channel. Jason, thank you so much for that. Oh, no so, problem. I don't understand TikTok. I am the old guy here with gray hair, and I don't know what I thought TikTok was for kids doing dances, but really? apparently it's you're more the than old that. guy. Well, I, yes, I. Well, I'm the old guy. You're the ancient guy, Chris. I'm, you know, that's. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, see, I was with you. Like, I did not like the idea of TikTok whatsoever, but my son, um, on his account, ended up blowing up and has like 160,000 followers. So I created um, an account just so I could keep an eye on his stuff. And I ended up finding so much cool stuff and I've been kind of hooked on it ever since. (laughs) Awesome. You can go to our website. It's www.theohiopodcast.com. On the left-hand side of the website, you'll find a link for TikTok. So if you're into that type of thing, uh, give us a like and follow, I guess, maybe is how TikTok does it. I don't yep. know. I, okay. And uh, and you can see what Jason posts there uh, for us. He, he's he got several different uh, clips, and I, I don't know if they're called Tic Tacs or whatever you call them. I just call them something. videos. Okay, videos <laughs> uh, that he's made there on TikTok that are pretty cool. Uh, of course, we have three other uh, podcasts. Uh, we have a Shots from the Shot, which Jason Monk is a part of, along with Nick Delanitis. And you guys, just before we recorded this one, recorded an episode of that, did you not? Yes, and uh, got a, some pretty cool stuff going on. It was sure. definitely a, a good episode. I, we're really starting to flow, <laughs> that's for sure. I can't wait to hear it. I'm sure you guys probably dove into uh, the off season for the Buckeyes and kind of the changeover on roster and maybe even that contract that uh, yeah, that was went to that head coach as well. Oh yeah, it was. Uh, we definitely had our uh, conversation on Holtman and we um, did a thing where we picked our all time starting five Ohio State basketball team and then we did a. Um, all time or uh, starting five by decade where you could pick one player from the 80s 90s 2000s 2010s and then the 20s but you could only pick one person from each decade and one at uh, each position so Mm. it it was kind of fun that sounds fun. We might have to steal that for uh, our show, Chris. Uh, Chris, we also do varsity videos. You want to give a little preview on uh, the next varsity videos that'll be coming out? Well, yeah, we just recorded a great show uh, yesterday, Eric. Uh, of course, we discussed American Underdog, which was the Kurt Warner story. Uh, just such a fabulous movie. And, and, you know, every week we get our every few weeks, I should say. Uh, we get on there and uh, we get on rank some sports movies. Uh, we are currently uh, our fans here on the OHIO podcast will remember our 60 form team uh, bracket we did last year uh, during the off season. Well, we are currently doing that on varsity videos. Uh, we just completed the first round and we are moving into the second round. And I'll tell you, it, we've seen some great matchups and we got a few gr- good ones coming up this uh, next time as well. So, yeah, definitely check it out. We we have a great time doing that. We dive into the movies a little bit and uh, just just a good time discussing films, which, of course, after Ohio State football is probably our second biggest passion. <laughs> yeah, uh, after our wives. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 I think that's right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and the other show, of course, is Buckeye Tobacco. I just started it where I uh, – and you can see it on our YouTube channel, believe it or not – See My Ugly Mug, where I review a cigar. I love smoking cigars. It's something I've been doing for years. And uh, so I review cigars and talk college football. And uh, it's it's taken off. Of course, this was something that uh, was kind of a birth child between myself and Lenny Zabo, who runs the Billy Bob Backyards Barbecue. And he said, hey, why don't you uh, why don't you start making some cigar videos? And I was like, OK, let's do it. So that's what I'm doing. And so you can listen to the audio of that right here uh, on the same uh, uh, device that you're listening to this podcast on. 
or you can go check it out on YouTube, like I said, uh, and and see what I look like. Um, not that anybody would want to do that, but uh, anyways, that's a lot of fun. So that's kind of our our podcasting lineup at at the point, and we've got some irons in the fire. Chris and I are working out with some Browns fans, possibly. Uh, I've been contacted by someone who runs a podcast in Columbus. It's just kind of a random Columbus sports podcast that he'd like to meet up with us. And and then Billy Bob's Backyard Barbecue, we've got something planned coming up next weekend on his channel as well. So lots of ways to get connected with us. And uh, we've got the, the previews heading our way for the season coming up soon. So uh, we'll have uh, at least one more good show before we dive into what will be the 2022 schedule for everybody. So make sure you hang tight when we come back after this com- short commercial break. I've got the interview with uh, Nick Hickman, who is the owner and president of Mastermind, who has been a sponsor for our podcast uh, since it's uh, basically it's Genesis and uh, happens to also be my boss. So he's got some really good stories. He was a student at Ohio State. You're going to uh, hang around and listen to what it was like for him uh, when he actually got married in the shoe. So oh, hang tight, everybody. Awesome. The OHIO podcast is brought to you by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360-degree high-definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at OnlineMastermind.com. And welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everybody. And now I am joined by the man, the myth, the legend, Nick Hickman, the owner and president of Mastermind and also my boss. And today he is joining me to talk about the Buckeyes and his fandom with Ohio State. But first off, Nick, thank you so much for the last, well, almost since the beginning of the genesis of this podcast. You and Mastermind have sponsored the OHO podcast, so thank you so much for that. And maybe you can tell everybody a little bit about yourself and about Mastermind. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, quite the amazing intro, no doubt. I'm sure <laughs> I'm going to live up to that one, but do appreciate it. Um, certainly, you know, give you the background, of course. Uh, myself, as you noted, Nick Hickman. I've been the president of Mastermind for coming up on a decade here. I've uh, been proud to have, of course, Eric working with us for quite a few of those. Eric, no doubt, will come up, I think, on seven. So, uh, But Mastermind's been, you know, certainly proud to go ahead and sponsor the OHIL podcast. Uh, this entire, really, I'd say the entirety of the show at this point, yeah. And it's really been nice to, to be something, I would say, on the, the cutting edge, right? It's what we love to be in the company, certainly what we do with uh, mobile mapping. And, you know, I think the OHIO podcast brings that as well. A lot of enthusiasm, a lot of excitement. And, of course, we want to bring that to our customers and clients, just like you do to your obviously viewers and listeners so at this point uh mastermind to give a little background of course and and who we're reaching out to and who we work with we work with uh, a whole basically array of different clientele but nonetheless the most being municipalities uh, and thank you and a shout out to the county engineers of ohio uh, who we mainly work with and the big thing that people always enjoy is mobile mapping so mobile mapping, if anyone ever relates, is kind of like when you look over and you see that Google Maps car driving down the road. Now, we're not Google, but of course, we actually perform a service very similar to that. And you're creating your own 3D world uh, with mobile mapping. And we provide that to these counties so that they can go out and actually measure and really take anything they want out of this 3D world after we've created it for them. Uh, assets and everything, traffic signs, guardrails and such. And it just creates such a safe environment for them so that we don't have uh, more people on the side of the road getting hurt and things. We can uh, remove that from the equation. So a big deal for us here at Mastermind to be on the podcast and uh, appreciate it. Yeah, so big shout out to Andy over at Wayne County. I know he listens to the podcast. We appreciate uh, all you do, Andy, and for being a big supporter of both Mastermind and the OHIO podcast. Now, Nick, you actually went to Ohio State. You are a graduate of the Ohio State University. I got to ask you, man, give us your story. Why Ohio State? Why did you choose to be a Buckeye? Because you're not from central Ohio. You're actually from up in northwest Ohio, I guess we could say, maybe northern Ohio. And 
and you were just as close to Ann Arbor, Michigan, distance-wise, maybe even closer than Columbus, Ohio. So why did you choose to be a Buckeye? First off, I don't know about that team up north. I'm not sure what that other word was. But I do know that otherwise, uh, probably because the Miami Hurricanes wouldn't have me. (laughs) So as crazy as it is, I grew up a Miami Dolphins fan. And I actually did apply to going down to be in Miami. I mean, let's face it, some nice weather and probably some... Well, nice looking girls down there when you turn in 18. <laughs> and uh, nonetheless, I decided, hey, you know, uh, I, I really enjoy this Ohio State school. I'm liking over here. Uh, let's let's give this a try. I had my best friend go in there as well. And um, so, you know, I chose Ohio State. But at the time, I uh, wasn't really even that into college football. It was all about the Miami Dolphins. Yeah, so you get to college, obviously you get indoctrinated and baptized in Ohio State football. And then you also meet Amber. So you didn't go down to Florida, you ended up going to Ohio State, and you meet your future wife, Amber. And I know that you and Amber got married on the, in the shoe. Was it the 50-yard line or the end zone? I can't remember. Tell us the story, Nick. So, of course, I meet the most beautiful <laughs> there you Ohio go. State, of course, at the Ohio State, so no need for those Miami Hurricanes. But uh, I met my wife, Amber Lynn Terry, who, of course, now Hickman. And so uh, we did. Uh, amazingly enough, we got married in the shoe. And I'll tell you, that's been one of the great stories of my life. I've really enjoyed. But we did actually uh, get the chance. We were married next to the American flag. So we were over. Uh, north side, zone, yeah, yeah, north end zone. But then we also, uh, how fun, we got to run uh, literally plays on the field with the entire wedding party. We were kicking field goals. Uh, I mean, we even got to change. They took us up and gave us a tour of the president's little box and that whole, you know, suites area. So we got changed up there. We come down, we get married next to the, you know, the flag post. Amber actually came down the aisle just the same way the band does when they come out. Uh, and then as we're running plays on, you know, the, the field, we've got a bunch of pictures of it. And then I was able to take a picture of Amber where I, you know, had her, uh, you know, in my arms. And I'm leaning over on the, the block O and the 50-yard uh, line. And that's actually our wedding picture in, in our living room. So amazing times. So this is where I insert the joke about how you were running plays and you scored on your wedding day. <laughs> right? I mean, that's... <laughs> I hope, right? (laughs) Indeed, yes. (laughs) Okay. All right. So tell me a little bit. Let's just say they scored more than once. Oh, 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 okay. Multiple touchdowns. Multiple touchdowns. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe you broke the record. I don't know. Um, Anyways, let's let's talk a little bit about your time when you were there in college. Maybe your your top football memory while you were in college. Maybe your favorite Buckeye. Um, Tell me a little bit about those times. So, uh, kind of laughing in the sense that and every day goes by, you feel more like an oldie, right? You know, you start thinking, oh boy, this memory or that, and then you realize, oh my gosh, that was a decade ago. Uh, I did actually go to school between 2004 and 2009, so luckily, uh, you know, maybe not forever ago, but definitely the decade. My memories, big ones that I can think of, I remember uh, Troy Smith when he was just about to win the Heisman when we did the uh, final game against TTUN, and he was doing his little swipe back feet Mm -hmm. motion and they had him come out in the field that was a fun one I mean I would argue though too one of the loudest I ever heard it in the stadium just deafening it felt like was when we played Vince Young at Texas and even though I unfortunately uh, rough outcome on that that was probably the loudest I'd ever heard in the stadium that was pretty amazing Uh, I would say the best ever there's a couple of them other than the wedding, of course, right? Yeah, right, 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 right. But yeah, other than that, uh, I would probably argue one of the best was watching the Penn State game. What year was that, Eric? Uh, oh, my gosh. I'm in 2016, is that, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was going to go 2016. No, 2017. Little, 17. Yeah, okay. because Dwayne Haskins was the next year in 2018, so 2017. Okay, so, yeah, so we had 2017, of course, you know, 
we're we're down by what it you know that was practically 21 points or something fourth quarter and I remember you know probably a lot like everybody else sitting down in my seat you know you're just in disarray or so it feels and I'm even texting my brother going you know it's over and next thing you know uh, I think it was Nick Bosa at the time actually if it's that far back if I remember I don't think it, or it was Joey I think it was Joey might have been was it Nick? Nick one of them strip sacked the quarterback if I remember right and it was like the final hope of wait we're gonna get the ball back there's somewhat of a chance and then of course the rest is history we win that game so that was uh, that was one of the most memorable moments I would have in the stadium as well but uh, a lot of fun games that's for sure my friend that's for sure when JT hits, I think it was Marcus Ball, the tight end, mm-hmm. over the middle for the go-ahead touchdown. Yes. I, you, I, I think it literally was an earthquake in Central Ohio. Like it, <laughs> it was. Like we were so loud that moment that we, we registered on the Richter scale. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that that's an actual real true event. Um, so, obviously, you and I, we go to a lot of games. Uh, we've been to games together. Uh Ryan Day, man, what what are you, what are your? I've never actually actually asked you this question. What are your thoughts about Ryan Day? Excited about you when Ryan Day was first handed the reins by Urban Meyer. I'm thinking, okay, this guy seems confident, but yet we're still having some questions, right? We're going through the turmoil with Urban Meyer, yet here comes this guy where Urban's so confident to hand him the reins, and I had my doubts about recruiting. And I think we all did, of course. But then all of a sudden, recruiting in his first year, and he just rocks it. I mean, we're getting left and right recruits, you know, four and five stars. And you're thinking, where's the fall off? There was supposed to be the dropout. I'm sure TTUN fans were just, you know, thrilled when we're over there getting half of the, the, you know, the whole top 100, it feels like. Okay, maybe not to that degree, but he really rocked it. And ever since then, he's exceeded my expectations. I would definitely say, you know, the worry, I'm sure even other Ohio State fans, and, oh, no, some NFL teams going to come in and, you know, gobble this guy up. But he's stayed true. He's been with us. So I'm thrilled he's the coach. I'm impressed as could be. Now, granted, we haven't won a championship under him. So when you start comparing him to Urban or Jim Trussell, that gets tough because where does he rank in there? But from the, you know, the I guess I would say the stress he had to go through to take over and the pressure and all and the way he handled it, phenomenal. Not many people could do that. So, and actually a fun little shout out, I guess we'll throw in there, but hard to get over the Jim Trussell thing since Dick Trussell, his brother, coached my father in high school at Gibsonburg, Ohio. There so, you go. There you go. I had to throw in the shout out over there to Dick Trussell and Jim Trussell, of course. So a little bit of uh, the history there. Whenever you can throw a shout out to the sweater vest, you got to do that. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? All right. <clears throat> so here you go. What are your expectations for this season as a Buckeye fan? Right away, expectation, BTTUN for sure. Mm-hmm. Number one, if that's not on all of their minds, it should be. Um, obviously, otherwise you could argue Notre Dame right away. Um, you got to come out, you know, out of the gate swinging. But okay, overall, that's the question more so. Are you going for playoffs for sure? Has to be, or else it's a bust. Given the fact that you got Stroud out there and Travion Henderson, and now our defense ramped up. I really like bringing in the defensive coordinator. Like where they're going, I can't imagine that. I would almost say the question is the national championship to me. So if I come out of the gates just saying, "Hey, a national championship or nothing," eh, maybe that's a little too much pressure. But I would almost argue at least getting there is exactly where you should be. You should be there. And if you're if you're not, probably felt like a failure. Now winning that could be different. We don't know who's going to be in that top team right there with us. Otherwise, but that's where I'd say. Excellent, excellent. All right, <clears throat> here comes the big one, man. Yeah. Last question, question I ask everybody. What does it mean to Nick Hickman to be a Buckeye? So a big one, right? Uh, so I think the way I see this is it's past, present, future of Ohio State. You know, 
basically, I go to Ohio State, I meet my wife there, I'm there with my best friends, you know, from high school, I meet literally uh, another one of my best friends who was even best man at my wedding, uh, Nick, Nick Bantz actually, give a shout out to him. But, uh, you know, I would say it's it's all of the memories and then the currents, even right now, the present, when we're going to these games still, we're still watching. I mean, here we are excited to go Notre Dame. We're talking about national championships. There's always that hope. So you've got, you know, these past memories. You've got the present where you're just enjoying even seeing the recruiting and everything going on. And then you've got the hope and future along with it. And you just mold that all together and you have Buckeye Nation. And that's that's for me. That's the uh, that's the entirety. That's what it means to be a Buckeye and all the culture and all the history with it. It's amazing. Yep, absolutely. I agree with you 100%, man. It's, it is the past, present, and future, and looking forward to the future of this season. So we thank uh, Nick for joining us and being our guest this week uh, and for his sponsorship of the OHIO podcast. We truly appreciate that and look forward to another great season of podcasting for all of you who listen. And uh, thanks in a large part to uh, Mastermind LLC and the company that Nick runs and making sure that we have the finances we, run, uh, we, we need to run this podcast on a weekly basis so thank you for that that's our show for this week everybody everybody as always be kind to one another i owe someone's oh and sing carmen ohio with all your heart and until next time oh go bucks oh come let's sing oh praise and songs through armor while our hearts rebounding thrill and joy which death alone can still summer's heat or oh, winter's cold the seasons pass the years will roll time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship oh hi yo